So we are going live now. Hello, everyone. As we have global audience, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Great to welcome you in our SAP Community YouTube stream today, powered by the SAP Global User Groups Organization. We are launching today a series of talks by SAP Strategic Compliance and Trust Office. And today we would like to talk about quantum computing. Is it a real threat for your information? And how can you protect your data and applications against it? Our speaker will be Sandeep Dolakia, who is Principal Security Architect within SAP Global Security and Cloud Compliance. Apart from his job at SAP, Sandeep has authored a book and published papers and blogs on various security relevant topics, including a feature article on zero trust in the ISSA journal. My name is Larissa Brinkman from the SAP Global User Groups Organization, and I'm your host. Before handing over to our speaker, let me share a few housekeeping rules. We kindly ask you to post your questions via live chat, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. To post your question, you need to be signed uh, up with your YouTube or SAP community account. The additional materials of this session, uh, like a PDF, will be available after the same link in the description to the video of today's session shortly after the stream is finished. With this, I wish you great interaction and over to you, Sandeep. Hello, everyone. And I really appreciate the introduction. And I really thank you, Aya and Iona, for organizing this and hosting this and inviting me. I know it, it takes lots of effort on your side to organize event like this. And I really appreciate that you give me the opportunity on the security with SAP series. So without any further ado, we will jump into the topic, the quantum, uh, the quantum computing. <clears throat> the quantum computing. And uh, so we will start uh, with what exactly the underlying science is, right? Which is quantum physics or quantum mechanics, what it is and how it is used uh, to do the uh, quantum computing, right? So uh, the principle and how it is used, what it makes uh, uh, quantum computer so effective, so fast and so uh, elegant that we are happy as as well as we are scared uh, that a threat it has for us, right? And then we'll talk about the threats and obviously we will go in detail about how we can prevent this threat with quantum cryptography and post-quantum cryptography, which is PQC. And uh, so this is the uh, two part basically and the part one we will do uh, right now and part two we are going to do uh, a few months down the road, but I will also briefly talk about last three bullet points in part three. So you have some idea what to look for the next um, uh, next time. So with that, right? So today, basically, we'll go with this in detail and highlight of the last three point. So uh, in lately, right, since the inception of Internet, I mean, we start everything by Google search or Wikipedia, right? How to learn if you want to learn something. And I did the same thing, right? When back in the day, when I started to figure out quantum mechanics, I was trying to figure out uh, what it is. And the Wikipedia defines that it's a bit, basically the behavior of subatomic particles. So um, what, what happens inside the atoms, right? And is behavior and that physics or that science is basically quantum mechanics. That's what uh, um, Wikipedia defines is. Now, what, what exactly it means? Like, see, in the general physics, right? Uh, the world in we live in 
when we see something moving, so we have the speed, we have speed of light, we have light, we have like force, uh, inertia, everything, right? We see it, we feel it, and we can deduct that, okay, this is what happened because of these steps. But the atomic, right? We don't see it. It, it happens at the subatomic layer. And until un late 1800s, we did not even know, right? That there are electrons and atoms and photons, right? So, so this is uh, only 125 years old science. And uh, once we once we started to learn about those, right, electrons and photons and all that, we actually realized that there is a lot more that that can offer, which we need to understand. And so it's a big science and we are not going to go into detail for like uh, entire science, but I will talk about three major points, which are very important for us to understand how quantum computers works. Okay. So first is the wave particle duality. Now this, this principle goes uh, way back to 1801, actually, uh, the, uh, the, the polymath uh, uh, scientist uh, from Britain, England, uh, named Thomas Young. And uh, uh, he, he actually was uh, uh, sitting at the end on the pond and he saw two ducks, you know, sail through the pond and he saw that uh, the pattern in the water and the, uh, the pattern actually overlaps each other and it changed the way it formed the pattern after the overlap. And he realized what would happen if I uh, do the same experiment with the light. So he actually, like, as you can see here on the left side, he actually used the light and obviously probably he didn't have a light bulb back then, but he used probably candle or natural light and put to put it through two slits. And so what happens at the end on, on the other side of the wall, and he saw dark and bright stripes. And he said, ah, it means that light does uh, overlap each other and cancels the pattern. And it's what he said, but he, he actually did not realize in 1801, but he actually laid first stone from the quantum mechanics thinking at least, right? Uh, if you fast forward, say about 100 years, like late 1800s again, right? Then people started duplicating this experiment. And actually uh, a physicist named uh, Max Planck, who is, uh, who is uh, now we uh, call him that, you know, first guy to really lay the stepping stones in the quantum mechanics um, and others, you know, they did this experiment again with the light bulb or like uh, a source of light, you know, uh, and they saw this, uh, pattern but what what uh, like if you see the figure on the right what they did eventually is re uh, replace that uh, uh, that continuous source of light with a photon gun what photon gun did photon gun basically they did uh, one photon they shoot one photon every second and they let it go for two hours and what they were hoping that when they open this room uh, a photon would pass either from the top slit or the bottom slit and on the wall they will have two bright spots of for or of light like car headlights right that was the expectation but that did not happen instead of they saw the same pattern bright and dark stripes on the wall which Thomas Yen saw it in 1801 I mean there was no difference the light source is different what's going on right there is something that it's happening here, which physics could not explain back then. The physics that we know of, we knew of, obviously. So they, they, they actually started to investigate and research a little more. And then they come up with the phenomena called uh, superposition. Now, what superposition? It means that uh, subatomic, like uh, atom, I mean, photon, electron, uh, ion, they can be in the two state at the same time. And it is what perhaps was happening, they thought here, that uh, photon was going uh, uh, this polarity, left, polarized, and right at the same time and went through two slits. And they said, oh, wait, so light has a light can go as a wave as well as particle also. So that that's uh, that is how the name wave particle duality came up. And the basically superposition meaning the particle could be in the same state, uh, two, two, two different particles. I mean, one particle 
could be in the two different states at the same time. So as an example, like if we take electron, we know electron spins, right? It spins up or spins down, right? Like photon straight or a straight. Uh, if it's a rectilinear photon, it could be straight or it could be horizontal, right? Vertical, horizontal. So what they saw that photon could be in both state at the same time or electron were spinning up at the same time spinning down. So electron was in the two state at the same time. And that says, oh my God, this double the double the efficiency right, of what we do. And uh, another uh, thing they observed uh, was uh, entanglement. Now what entanglement is that even if two electrons are miles apart, right? But if they are in correlation or if they are synchronized with each other, they can be in sync, meaning if one spins, other spins, but other spins in the different direction. So one goes up, other goes down, and they have no physical relationship with each other. They are just in synchronization. And that was very weird, right, for us to believe. Uh, now, I mean, this was uh, very difficult for us to believe also, but then the guy name or like physicist name, Erwin uh, uh, Schrodinger uh, came along and he said, okay, I, I'm going to explain you in a different way, the same phenomena of superposition. So he actually, you know, what, what we call this now is a Schrodinger's cat experiment. And he actually explained with a very simple theory, he said, okay, you take a cat and some uh, pope and some uh, poison and put both in the cage, close the cage. Now you don't know what's happening in the cage. You leave the cat and the food for an hour. During that time, cat could be alive because she did not eat the food or she could be dead because she ate the food, right? Uh, and uh, she died. So we don't know what the state is. Exactly the same way electrons are under the hood, right? I am from Detroit, so we talk in the automotive uh, lingo. So under the hood, uh, electron could be spinning up or spinning down. We don't know. And uh, they, they and, and like electrons could be entangled. And, and this state is called like coherence. They are in coherence. And longer the coherence time, better it is for us to get the output because it could uh, spit out more more output right so but the key is when you try to observe the status of the electron or the photon or the ion it decores meaning it it comes back to one state so while cat was in the cage right it was in the coherent state because we did uh, we did not know whether it was spinning up or spinning down cat is alive or cat is dead okay uh, and like you know, this was a coherent state. So for us, it was in both state at the time, like electron was in the both state. And uh, this was coherence time. As soon as we open the cage, we decohers and the state collapses. Uh, electron comes to spinning up only. Cat, we know it's alive or dead, right? So one state, right? And, and, and like if you love cat, don't worry. Schrodinger didn't really do this. Cat did not die. This is just what they call thought experiment. So don't worry, okay? There's no animal harm or whatnot here. But this is just a thought experiment. But the point here is he, he actually explains this so easily for people like us, right? Because it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's very hard to believe for us that how can one thing be in the two different state? And it is what he was trying to explain us. Now, if you still think that this is all weird and you don't believe this, it's hard to understand. Trust me, you are not alone. You have lots of company. People like Richard Feynman, Albert Einstein, actually, entanglement. Right? He said it's a spooky action at distance. I mean, he it was very difficult for him to believe that two electrons so far apart still work in synchronization. I mean, he thought it's totally spooky. And uh, the cat guy, right? The, the Schrodinger feels sorry that he has to do anything with this science. I mean, things like this, right? So people really... Uh, not you and me, but uh, those who worked on this for years and years also felt that this is very difficult to understand and even harder to explain. Um, I, I actually think that, you know, if you can't understand all this stuff, don't worry, just get married 
and your spouse will keep you busy. You know, you will not have to think about all these things. So uh, there is a way out of all this mess if you uh, think it's weird. But so uh, the point here is that quantum mechanics or the physics, it's very old. It's, it's, it goes way beyond our digital uh, PCs and uh, digital world, right? But in last 30, 40 years also, we have used uh, quantum mechanics in various forms, like in MRI, the lasers, the atomic clock and the GPS and like how to find where the oil and gas is under the earth, right? That's all quantum physics. So application of quantum physics, it's not, to, not new to us. We have been doing this, we just don't know. But now I guess we have to learn because you know it could hurt us if we don't know what's going inside those atoms. So how all these help us, right? Understanding, so here you go. So let's do the quantum computing 101 in next five minutes. So what is qubit, right? Like a digital world, right? We have a bit, it's zero or one, right? Two state. The qubit, it's a three dimensional bit and it could be in both state at the same time. Now, as I said, right, the electron could be in both states, same thing happens here, right? So it could be in two states at the same time. Now, how it helps us, like assume that you have a three bit logic gate, right? If you are digital, if you know digital electronics, three bits, right? So you could have zero, 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 uh, two, zero, 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 uh, two, one, 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 right? One, one, one meaning you have eight bits, but your digital gate would be only in one of these eight. Uh, it can't be in all eight at the same time. So the task, if, if, if you have a task for your digital gate, we take eight steps, it would, it would take eight clock cycles to perform that function. On the flip side, our qubits, you know, they fire on, all the cylinders, like we say in Detroit, right? It fires on all the cylinders, meaning that it could be in all eight state at the same time. But the key is as long as it's in the coherent state, right? If we decourse, we are done. But as long as it's in coherent state, it is in the all uh, eight state at the same time, meaning it could spit out that eight clock cycle could be in one clock cycle, right? Because all eight uh, things happens at the same time. So if you don't know the digital electronics and if you do not understand this uh, analogy, right, with the logic bits, take another example, right? Uh, there is a math class, there are 11 students. One student is like a smart depends, you know, very smart. Other 10 are average. So uh, there is a math exam and in that problem, uh, uh, in that exam, there are 10 problems. The smart student, she takes uh, 10 minutes to solve all 10 problems super smart average student takes three minutes to solve each problem so if a teacher thinks that that the other 10 student would take 24 minutes the smart student takes only 10 minutes so what uh, teacher does he gives one problem so to all of those average students and the smart student gets 10 problems so now smart student still takes 10 minutes but those average student finish all 10 in three minutes because everybody performed one problem at a time, right? So work was divided, right? So basically, the qubit was working on all 10 states. Uh, against your di a digital bit was very fast, but doing one at a time. So your smart computer or the supercomputer or the smarty pen student, right? Although it could be very smart, the but you know, uh, the qubits were working in 10 stages at the same time. So they could do this in three minutes. Uh, so that's that's what Alexander Halevo, uh, H O L E V V O Halevo, uh, uh, he he's a math genius from Russia, uh, told us in 1973. He said, a "Qubit and digital bit store same in, same amount of information. The information stored is same. Okay, I mean qubit does not have any magic power to uh, do like." extra work but is the way they use that information right they you they actually spread it out in all state at the same time like the students right and that's what the alexander Halevo said uh, so uh, back to this right uh, the uh, 
What is the many people misrepresent quantum computers with the supercomputer, but they are not same, right? Uh, what happens in supercomputers? They are just like our PCs, right? They are no any different. They still need the same CPUs, same RAM, but they are very elegant. They are very fast, right? Their CPU clock speed is extremely fast. Their RAM access time, the burst time is very, very low. The latency is very low. So it can, and, and like it could have like very high end CPUs and multiple core, multiple CPUs, right? So it, it does those eight clock cycle very fast but it doesn't do eight at the same time. So uh, basically supercomputers are still the traditional computer, very fast quantum computers works on a different principle. Uh, so that they are two different animals, just that we know. Now, how do we build qubits, right? So uh, Richard Feynman, right? Uh, he actually said in 1981, he lamented the fact that uh, uh, we can't build quantum computers with digital bits. That's not going to happen because digital bit, like Halevo said, we can't store, uh, although we store the same information, the same amount of information, we can't use as effectively, right? So what you do then in late 90s, I think IBM started and there, there are three options, right? Atom, electrons or photons we could use. And uh, IBM actually heavily used this uh, technology right uh, at the superconductor right now even now and uh, they are going i mean we'll talk about it uh, but they are very ahead in in terms of uh, their approach here uh, but so these are the various options how you can build qubits but the problem here is uh, qubit uh, needs very cold uh, cold temperatures like uh, 100 degrees below zero and even the slight EMI, right, uh, the electromagnetic interference or noise could decoerce the state. So it is very touchy and uh, it is very expensive to, to make this and, and even extremely expensive to keep them in the coherent state from the long time. See, that's our battle, right, to keep these qubits in coherent state for long enough time to break the RSA as an example, as we talk now, right. We will discuss that later, but that's the gist of it, right. It is why we are not there yet, right? Although uh, uh, big companies like uh, IBM, right, trying since 1998, why we don't have one? Because it's very expensive and very sensitive. So there are drawbacks, but we will discuss all that in detail in the next few minutes. So yeah, everything was well and good. And then uh, this guy, uh, again, the math wizard called Peter Shore from Peter Schroer from MIT came along and he said, oh, we can use this quantum theory to solve the math problems. And he actually proposed a paper, uh, this is all theory, uh, by the way. And he said, okay, we can solve the math problem of factorization very effectively with his uh, math paper, uh, with his theory or his hmm, algorithm, right? He said, we could solve it effectively. And that basically breaks our public key algorithms right now. That's the problem he created. Now, he had a very good intention, right, to solve the math problems. But, uh, well, hackers, I did not take it in that spirit. And uh, they would use this to break uh, the asymmetric key, right? The, the problem here is the fundamental issue is, right, the asymmetric key, as you all probably know, so we'll not go into details, but briefly, works on eighth grade math problem, right? So take two prime numbers and uh, and the product of this mm, prime number is your public key. Now that product, if you have that product, is hard to find two prime numbers back, which is your private key. Because if you have the prime number product very large, it's hard to factor them to those two prime numbers, right? It's almost impossible with the technology we have right now. So the problem is very easy, right? It's eighth grade math. And we as a people relied on eighth grade math, but we, our, uh, our uh, faith was on the slow technology. The technology will never come up to the speed to break this eighth grade math, right? And well, what do we know, right? We, we are proven wrong and AI and QC and everything is out there. And we are at a risk of breaking uh, that factorization problem. 
Now P and Q, the two prime numbers are not very small, right? In in the public key, they're like at least 100 digits or more, right? Along uh, prime numbers. And you multiply, they're like up to 500 digit long numbers, right? Sometimes. So these are big numbers. And to find two primes of 100 digit each, it's very difficult. Um, so, I mean, it's not as simple as I said. As I just said, it's not really an eighth grade problem, but the basic theory is, uh, basic idea is eighth grade, right? So that that was one. And then uh, in 19, this happened in 1994. Then in 1996, Love Grover came along and he said, hey, when you have a, a database, right, unstructured database, and if you want to search, right, un, I mean, a database, if you want to do the unstructured search, it takes long time right now. But if you use quantum algorithm, it could speed up to four times. And he actually used that. So, you know, companies like Google or SAP for that matter, right? Where you have huge data in the cloud. Uh, how, how do you do a search? And this, this uh, information can help us. But again, hackers have their hands on that too, right? The algorithms. And they said, okay, we will use this to uh, uh, break the uh, symmetric algorithm. And it's not broken, though it's weakened. Uh, and, and and like we can still save it right with the longer key size, but of course it slows down the encryption. But uh, it's not still uh, broken, anyways, right? So so these two, right? When these two, uh, Love Grover and Peter Shore proposed their papers, uh, people started thinking that okay, now we have to protect uh, algorithms from uh, post quantum, right? So what are the real threats here, right? Like I, I mean, well, we already talked about factorization and all that briefly. So we are not, I'm not repeating that, but here is an example. So it takes like 600 computers uh, for 120 digit uh, factorization for several months, right? But a quantum computer can do it in few hours, uh, depending on we have enough qubits and we will talk about that math later. So it's not as easy as I spell out here, but it can be done, right? But the issue is, right, why, why it's an issue? We don't have qubits yet and it's not reliable and technology is probably five, 10 years out. So why worry right now? So what we call is a long shelf life data. So data which retains, which doesn't change for a long time, like your SSN, right? If you have a social security number or your date of birth, or uh, your name or your uh, uh, mother's, uh, mother's maiden name, right? This information is not going to change, right? So for example, right, if you apply for a bank loan, right, online, and you enter your date of birth, your social security number, your mother's maiden name, and you submit that file uh, for the bank loan application, and hacker, Oscar, right, on the way, uh, extract that data, encrypted data, and now he's going to save that data and he keep that data in his basement in external file because he know he can't decrypt that data. He cannot undo the uh, encoding, right? But when he has his hands on the, uh, uh, when when he will have his hands on the qubits, right? Which can decrypt, right? The, the quantum computers 10 years from now, he can decrypt your loan application and obviously your address may have changed, your bank account would have changed, your bank would have changed, but your, your social security number, your mother's maiden name, your date of birth, your probably name, right? Unless you got married again or something, if you are a woman and change name, like some countries do. So, uh, so I mean, those things will still remain same, right? And uh, I could go and use that uh, all that information, apply for bank loan on your name by a big mansion and you pay the mortgage, right? So uh, this too, is, I mean, my point is this is the example of a long shelf life data. And that's the threat we have right now, although we don't have quantum computers, but this could happen, right? So what is the way out? So actually Google back in 2015, they actually thought, right? Uh, before everybody else, that this could be a problem. So what they did, they actually used uh, in uh, Google Chrome, they used ECC, and along with that, they they also offer something called New Hope. New Hope is a uh, uh, post is a post quantum 
the cryptography algorithm post quantum cryptography algorithm and uh, which could be used uh, to encrypt right so that even quantum computer can't break so what they did they took the ecc and the yeah and then the, they do another layer of encryption with new hope right like a wrapper so now even if a hacker to save the data in his basement in the hard drive and 10 years later when he tried to decrypt he won't because new hope is there for his protection right uh, on the top of it uh, so that is the idea they deploy and i think it's a very smart idea the problem they ran into and again we don't know the real story because there is no official word out but the based on the google uh, google searches and rumors that uh, new hope was a uh, patented algorithm and like in google chrome you know uh, google actually offered on the top right back then in 2015 if you remember uh, there was a click and if you click and drop down it offer allows you to encrypt twice like uh, first with ecc which is default and if it allow you to another layer of encryption with new hope and so new hope went back to google and said i mean went to google and said hey every time somebody does this you are you good to pay us because you know we have the rights on this and uh, then uh, obviously we don't know the story but they they had a discussion and they did not come to an agreement so google pulled it back so only thing we know for sure is google pulled it back in 2016 uh, but the story says that uh, uh, paying money to them uh, was the issue right because it was a uh, the a new hope was under a patent at that time in us so this is the way out and this is what happened to google back then so people my point is people have been thinking this for 10 years now right about all this this is not new this is we 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 did not realize this two weeks ago basically this has been around a problem that technical people and security people are thinking and try to solve this for at least 10 years right 2015 so let's let's get back to uh our main core topic here right and the quantum cryptography what is post quantum cryptography right? what is the difference so the quantum cryptography or qc right is basically and well is also known as quantum key distribution well uh, it should be quantum encryption key distribution right qed so this a uh, quantum encryption key distribution and i will explain you why it's called quantum key encryption encryption key distribution uh, but uh, uh, they obviously we already talked about that they can't run on the uh, pc that we have they worked on the physics right they don't work on the math problem uh, and uh, um, it is very hard to crack it because every time somebody try to do that uh, hack it uh, the uh, basically receiver would know it will be detected you know because photons will be dropped and i will show you how the photons will be dropped so it will be detected easily there is no way hacker can tap into it and you don't know there is it it's a, a system is 100% full proof very robust very elegant very efficient but very expensive very sensitive because you know we have to be in the coherence remember and it's a small noise or emi boom knock you out so we we really get have some way before we get there and it's very expensive every company can't or like almost all all of us can't do it so what is the way out so we we go back to our old uh, math problems right eighth grade math we go back to that but now at this time we go a little higher math like 12th grade or maybe uh, a little higher math but we still rely on the math difficulty of math to solve this so post quantum uh, the pqc the post quantum crypto uh, post quantum uh, cryptography is basically uh, uh, we could use on the pcs we have right now they they work on the based uh, Uh, they work on the math based problems they are difficult to i mean somewhat difficult to implement uh, because the, it could be slower if it's a long key and all that we will talk about it but uh, uh, overall they are stable and inexpensive right so uh, this is the way to go for now 
this is our bread and butter if you want to keep your data security secure and as you see in the right here and i should have explained this before actually when we were talking about long shelf life data the rsa right rsa the filman and ecc the elliptical curve in the cryptography these three are already broken because they work on the asymmetric key or the public key right like i said the public key is already uh, broken by thanks to mr shore uh, aes and sha sha actually is not an encryption per se uh, but uh, it's a hashing right and but but under the hood sha use the block server same same as aes so sha n is like 1 2 3 right there we can so is aes is we can right aes and uh, these three are pqc basically post quantum and these three macalis uh, ntru and uh, layer uh, uh, is based now what happens here uh, is a uh, uh the mac alice was it's very old and it was in uh, running in, in 1998 with aes right when they dis, uh, uh, when they were trying to pick one standard for the nist was trying to pick a standard for aes it was still in running back then but because of the long key key size it was not selected but we'll talk about it later so but these three are not broken as of now mm. so this is the status of various uh, algorithms so quantum cryptography right like i said and and i have taken this diagram from a book called uh, the code book is written by simon singh uh, it's a very a very nice book and it's geared towards like non technical or semi technical people it is written in a story form but is equally informative for people like us who know uh, all this right so if you have a chance i would highly recommend that you read this book uh, the code book Simon Singh, his last chapter is dedicated to quantum cryptography, and this book is twenty years old, right? So you can imagine how long people have been thinking about this. So how it works, right? So uh, he he actually you know, they actually use photons, and like uh, as we know, as I explained you right earlier, the photons uh, have like uh, two different types, right? The rectilinear, rectilinear photons, which could be either vertical or horizontal. and other is diagonal so it could be left diagonal or right diagonal right so uh, these are the four four ways out you know, for photons to travel from one way to other now uh, we could decide that okay if it's a rectilinear for a photon the vertical would be one horizontal would be zero or we could do horizontal could be one vertical would be zero i mean we could decide whatever way we want same way diagonal photons right 1 0 0 1 1 1 0 1 okay so these are the options we have now the sender in this in his case uh, simon said uh, alice alice sends these photons uh, sequence of photons to bob and bob detects this right so bob use bob bob has no idea right what kind of photons are going to come rectilinear and if it's horizontal i mean this is going to vertical or horizontal or this or that he has four options he has no idea right so he's going to uh, use his guts and try to put the filter two types and he's try to detect okay and the random guess right obviously some some will be detect right okay this is correct i thought it would be one and it is one i thought it would be one and it is one or i thought it would be zero it is zero all right he just take a guess and try to pick and he get lucky in few and he pick those uh then uh, alice and bob can talk uh, now they don't have to talk encrypted or anything like that uh, they can talk on the phone whatsapp text or even shout out of the window right that hey bob uh, did you did you get my photon and bob said yes alice i did and i think first fourth fifth seventh and ninth are uh, diagonal rectilinear rectilinear diagonal diagonal this is the sequence and he says yep you got that right so now oscar could hear this right but oscar has no idea right what it means because uh, diagonal okay and number one uh, we don't know what uh, what he has used right and what 
the sequence it will be. So as you can see here in right that I give, I mean, I simplified this diagram. So out of all this sand, uh, they agreed on these four, basically one, zero, one, zero. But all, all uh, Oscar or the hacker or your uh, neighbor who was uh, hearing uh, through the window uh, knows that either the photon was uh, sent as horizontal, I mean, rectal rectilinear or diagonal. He or she has no other idea, right? It's R or D, that's it. So uh, there is no way they can crack this. And it is why this quantum cryptography, and, and like once this sequence is decided, I mean, and obviously it's not just four bits, right? it, it, it's longer. But uh, once, once this pattern is decided, right? Uh, it's a quantum encryption key distribution. That's how it's called QED also. Uh, this one, the quantum cryptography. And this is how it works. Now, if, if say for example, uh, your neighbor, he, he hears you and says, ah, they are doing this. And if he or she tries to detect this, what they have to do, they have to put another filter here, right? And once they put this filter, if 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 they get it right, that photon will not reach to Bob. The photon will be dropped. So if Alice is sending one photon every one second, uh, fourth second, Bob will not get the photon because Oscar got it right, luckily. Uh, sixth second, ninth second, eleven second, there are photons which are dropping here. And uh, Bob would know either there is something wrong on the... Uh, a physical land, uh, physical link, or somebody is trying to detect. So immediately he would say, "Hey, Alice, something is fishy. Let's stop it." Right. So it is very easily detectable. That's the key here. Right. That, that's why that makes it even more secure. But it's very expensive and all that good stuff. I think we are running out of time, so I'm going to very quickly through the next. So the PQCs, right? We have four different, uh, actually five. We have five, five different options and we'll talk about it in detail, right? We'll deep dive on each of this next time. But uh, just that we know the code base, right? The code here, code doesn't mean like software code or like, you know, encoding. Code meaning this like error code technology. So when you send uh, uh, data from one point to other point, you basically add some error coding in there, right? And uh, like something like, uh -huh. something like we had a salt right but it's not really salting it's it's oh, and like math what they used what they call is like gopa code uh and uh, that's the theory used behind this and and mac Ellis, he actually proposed this in like i said way back in 78 and it was in and and like it is uh, the issue is large key and it was in a run a good fight uh, it gave to reindal back in 1998 when they picked AES, right? Uh, but uh, because of the slowness, it was not picked. And it it is not picked again right now by NIST, okay? Anyways, that's another story because they found which is more efficient than this. But uh, this is the code base. Then the lattice base, right? This is where we use our vector-based pro math problem, the lattice base, right? So there are two vectors, short vector, long vector. Long vector, easy to plot on, on the lattice math. And that would be your public key, short vector, difficult. Uh, and, and we'll go in the detail about this uh, with the vector and the lattice-based math. But so that would be your, your key, right? Uh, your mm, secret key. And you don't share this with anybody. And uh, from that key, you can't derive the public key. The, I mean, from public key, you can't derive that short vector. So that's how it works. And uh, this is the, the uh, theory. Uh, they picked actually as a winner for the NIST, uh, for PQC. And I'll tell you, there are uh, some out there since 1996. And, and, and this can work effectively even with FHE, the fully homomorphic encryption, right? And so, well, this also is a large key size, but is efficient in terms of speed compared to Mac is the code base. The multivariant, as the name indicates, right? They're like uh, multiple... Unknown variable in a problem again is a vector problem, but uh, well, it's a math equation basically, and uh, multiple equations with multiple unknowns, and then you try to solve it, right? So, uh, uh, 
it is a difficult even for quantum computers but in quantum computers are very effectively at solving problem like this right okay if you have multiple like as an example right if you are a um, a delivery office right you have like 10 trucks and you want to figure out uh, how each truck should pick their route so that it's most efficient okay if you do it with your pc right now it would take them for years or i mean long time it wouldn't years but it would take the software would take long time right the when qubits fire on all cylinders and if you provide enough coherence time a quantum computer can solve that problem that okay truck number one should go to north south east west and two should go south east blah blah all that right this subdivision this subdivision uh, pick your route it would plot your route for 10 truck i mean 10 truck is a small number but hundreds of trucks in almost seconds right if you have the right amount of qubits and enough coherence time so those kind of problems the quantum computers are very effective in in dealing with uh, but uh, you know these equations uh, it's believed that so far we are safe with that and the hash base right again this is used for the signature algorithms these are like hash functions right like one way encryption or one way hashing and uh, yeah and then the fifth one is um, what is called like uh, isogeny based isogeny is like a super singular math math equations and uh, so uh, nist nist actually selected this uh, as a winner uh, for the nist right now uh, and this is lattice based and th these three are used for the signature algorithm right the digital signature uh, but uh, nist also thinks that we, we should have another one right we should not rely only on lattice based because you know reality is we don't really know what it's going to unfold right when we have the quantum computers available to us so they are also trying to evaluate some more and the one i said uh, which looks very promising the psych uh, super a singular uh, uh, isogeny based right so uh, this this is has a very small key size actually and in 2012 it was 2011 it was proposed and soon after it was broken once but they are, they are improving obviously and is it i mean right now it seems okay it could be one of the winner eventually but we don't know and this macellis classic wasn't selected i mean it was in nist said it will be in run but i don't think it's going to make it uh, so here is the problem right the 256 bit ecc crypto right uh, ecc encryption right uh, with uh, um, like how long it would take to break with the qubit it take like 317 million years i mean 317 million qubits right uh, and if you want to do it in the short time it would i mean one day it would still take 13 million qubits so that's the long way to go so like i said it's not like happening next year but uh, because of the long shelf long shelf life data we have to be protective now and there are ways to implement this and we will again talk about this next time how 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 we are trying to do this in sap and how people should do this in general uh, to implement this effective that we will talk next time uh, so these are the various points that we we should think about it and there is a, a quantum a supremacy a supremacy thing that happened in uh, 2019 when uh, google had a computer which uh, which they claim that you know uh, a traditional computer could take long long time but this quantum computer could do it in short time so um, that's where the term was coined the quantum supremacy in 2019 now what the leaders could do like okay make sure the a crypto program is agile vigilance they have to be out uh, on okay what is out there what is not out there uh, start doing the wrapper like Google did, right? The hybrid. They should have a vision. And obviously, it's not if, it's when, right? All that. And 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 the one thing I did not mention that, you know, NIST actually wants against the uh, patent issue. And they actually recommend that uh, we use what they propose because they actually 
negotiate these terms beforehand before the release so we don't end up in a new hope situation right uh, these are the implementers uh, oh, wrong title sorry about that but uh, these are the major players who offer the quantum labs and some of these are actually free you can actually create an account and sign up uh, this is free i know i mean it was at least uh, a few months ago and go uh, google also offers a free version for um, for, for the uh, quantum ai lab right and you can uh, create an account play with it see how you feel about it you know it it it's very nice to try it out these different links and uh, last but not the least i'm uh, writing a book on the topic of uh, modern cryptography it will be out uh, in late summer early fall time frame uh, by Reinweck Publishing. Uh, so you will uh, be able to read a lot more in this book about uh, all the different encryption types, uh, including PQC and Bitcoin and AI and how all they, how they are impacted with the cryptography. Mm. Next month in May, uh, uh, another individual from our group, Nick Pace, uh, will be uh, doing uh, talk on AI. So please join. He, uh, he has a long experience in the AI world and he would be, and, uh, and like he's, uh, uh, he has lots of information to share in this area. So I really encourage everybody to join this. It will be a fun and inf uh, interesting and informative session. Uh, so hope you all can make it and these are the various ways to reach me if you need to. Uh, and thank you for time. And I will hand it over back to host, Larissa. All right. Uh, thank you, Sandeep. Thank you for this deep dive uh, for on uh, quantum computing and cryptography uh, techniques. So I think it's great for those uh, who can uh, would like to understand the um, what's behind the scenes. And uh, I can only encourage our audience to come up with the questions. Um, I think it's a uh, great uh, content that we uh, heard from Sandeep. And uh, also we can only um, yeah, promote and also bring your attention to the upcoming session in May, uh, where we will be uh, focusing on AI. I've also pasted the link in the chat for those who uh, would like to immediately set a reminder. So uh, we can only recommend to leverage this. Um, as we uh, allow a few minutes for the audience to come up with the question, um, I have a question that came up during your presentation, Sandeep, and I'm wondering uh, what SAP is doing for BQC. Do you have any insights on that? Right. So SAP, like uh, I would think like all, uh, like everybody else, right? SAP is also trying to implement uh, um, a different uh, technology. But uh, before we do that, right, we are, we are trying to go through the inventory phase and figure out which data is really we want to focus first. So, so we are in the investi investigation inventory stage. But uh, and and we are already trying to expand the uh, key key size eventually and all that uh, on the uh, table right now. And we have actually formed a team. Uh, we call it like cryptography COE, uh, the center of excellence, uh, uh, center of expertise. And uh, I'm I'm also in that uh, cryptography COE, and we have uh, all the uh, experienced individuals who are trying uh, to implement uh, the strategy to protect uh, data and information. All right, thanks for that. Um, mm -hmm. As we are almost reaching the top of the hour, 
Um, and I can't see any questions in the chat, but uh, it's great to have your uh, contact information on the screen. And as I've already said, the PDF of this uh, session will be published uh, under the description to this video uh, shortly after the presentation is finished. So with this, I can only thank you, Sandeep, for this presentation, for this uh, great deep dive. And uh, thank you to the audience for being with us, for uh, listening and learning. Um, it's uh, especially when you learn new technology, there are a lot of things that are probably unclear, but feel free to connect with Sandeep uh, for any kind of follow-up discussions. With this, thank you very much and bye-bye. Thank you.